A very good day and good evening to everyone. Welcome to the FAO webinar, where we will present the re regional review of aquaculture for the Sub-Saharan region. My name is Anna Menezes, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Thank you all for giving us a bit of your very precious time and for joining us here. Mr. Matthias Wolver, the head of the aquaculture branch, will now deliver a few, few welcoming remarks. Matthias, please, will you have the floor? Thank you very much, Anna, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. A very good day to all of you. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you to this webinar which is the fifth in a series of seven consecutive webinars. There are a number of important reasons for FAO to be organizing these events this particular week. First, the year 2020 has kicked off with a reaffirmation of our global commitment and call for coordinated and accelerated actions towards achieving the sustainable development goals and the 2030 agenda. So what role can and will aquaculture play in this decade of action? And what actions should be prioritized for a better impact of aquaculture, particularly for the zero hunger goal? These are key questions we had wanted to discuss at the FAO NACA Global Conference on Aquaculture Millennium Plus 20 which was supposed to be held in Shanghai this week. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to, to postpone the conference. And in agreement with our host, the Chinese Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs is now scheduled for new dates 22 to 27 September, 2021. Now, proposing future actions for greater impact in aquaculture should be informed by sound knowledge, by facts and figures. And that brings me to my second point. At FAO, we have been compiling these reviews since 1995, every five years. And we are about to complete the 2020 edition right now. So providing our latest results, as we had planned to do in Shanghai, China, is precisely the background and purpose for engaging with you now. And what will be presented today are the key messages, the challenges, and importantly, the options for the way forward in the Sub-Saharan Africa region. Presentations and discussions with distinguished panelists representing different stakeholder groups will complement the agenda. And I believe we can all look forward to a very interesting and stimulating exchange. Thank you very much for your attention and back to you, Anna. Thank you very much, Matthias, for highlighting uh, what are the background of these webinars. At this point, I'd like to inform you that today's webinar is honored with the presence of our own FAO ADG RAFT, Dr. Abeb El Gabriel, who will address this meeting for the opening remarks. Then just as a bit of the procedures, the author of the regional review will share with us his presentation of the key message, which will be followed by a panel discussion from uh, an array of uh, invited experts that are the pride of Africa. After that, we will have a very short uh, question and answer session. I use also this moment to ask you to please be sure to use the question answer box on the bottom of your screen and post uh, your questions or your comments or your recommendations. Also, please note that the webinar is being recorded for your further use. At this point, I have the pleasure to introduce 
the assistant, the FAO Assistant Director General for Africa, Dr. Abebe El Gabriel, who has kindly accepted to virtually join us and provide some guidance for matters related to development of the aquaculture sector. After working for many years as a researcher and academician in Ethiopia, followed by an incredible career at the African Union Commission, Dr. Bebe El Gabriel joined FAO in 2015. He is one of the greatest champions of food security and nutrition in Africa, livelihoods, and especially youth and women employment in the agrarian sector across all value chain. He is a stronger advocate of the aquaculture sector. Unfortunately, due to a conflicting agenda with ARC 31, he cannot be present, but he has sent his video message that uh, I would kindly ask Ricardo to assist us with the video. Thank you, Ricardo. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, participants of the Regional Review of Aquaculture in Africa. My name is Abebe Haile Gabriel. I am the Assistant Director General and FAO Regional Representative for Africa. It's an honor for me to address you in this important occasion. I'm confident that the dialogue among decision makers, stakeholders, and development partners will facilitate concerted and bold actions on aquaculture development in Africa. Fish and fishery products are essential in the fight against poverty, hunger, and malnutrition. Aquaculture has been one of the fastest growing production systems in the world and is expected to be a major source of aquatic food for the world's growing population. Available evidences indicate that sub-Saharan African countries contribute less than 10% to global aquaculture production. The past 10 years have been mixed, uh, have seen mixed developments in aquaculture in the region. Although capture fisheries are still significant and dominant, the share of aquaculture in total fisheries and aquaculture production has been slowly increasing from 2% in 2000 to 8% in 2018. In those 18 years, the annual growth rate of aquaculture in Sub-Saharan Africa has been 11%. If we exclude aquatic plants, the annual growth rate amounts to 14%. Then growth has slowed since 2018, mostly due to seaweed disease and infections, constant increasing costs for doing agriculture, aquaculture businesses, growing competition, and difficulties in accessing loans with affordable interest rates. In some countries, banks sometimes ask for up to 35% interest rate for a loan and a very short grace period for repayment. This simple example illustrates how national businesses, if not alive to external capital and external interests, face insurmountable challenges, leading entrepreneurs to lose hope and instead invest in other sectors or regions. There has also been the perception that aquaculture is technically complex and capital intensive undertaking, thus difficult to handle. As a result, entrepreneurs and commercial banks tend to become reluctant to take risks. At the same time, a number of countries have not established comprehensive aquaculture policies or appropriate aquaculture legislation that are needed to promote sustained growth of the sector. The recent slowdown is very worrying for the sector's future and its potentials to make a real contribution to food security and nutrition, as well as generation of employment opportunities and economic growth in Africa. The COVID-19 pandemic has further complicated the problem. The restrictive measures introduced to contain the spread of the virus have impacted supply chains. The fishery sectors have been among the most impacted. Concerted and urgent actions are needed to reverse this negative trend. There is a great potential to tap into to promote aquaculture in Africa through application of science, technology, and innovation, as well as through adopting enabling policy and regulatory frameworks. Sustainable intensification 
innovative value chains and adequate policy and regulatory frameworks are essential for realizing the potentials of aquaculture development in Africa. The productive potential of the aquaculture sector could be leveraged for diversifying economies and livelihoods beyond land-based activities, while contributing to meeting the sustainable development goals on ending hunger and malnutrition. African aquaculture needs to attract investment, including from financial institutions ready to support business proposals from African development institutions and encourage young African entrepreneurs. FAO continues to, to be committed to support the efforts of member countries and regional partners towards realizing this huge potential. I wish you a fruitful dialogue and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Doctor, for your guidance and especially for your upbeat message of the potential of aquaculture for food security, nutrition, as well as the economic growth in Africa. But also, thank you for your honesty and for pointing us out the areas where we have been struggling and we still need to improve to make the sector a real contributor. Without any further ado, I will, not, I will now ask our author and consultant, Mr. Blessing Mafum, to share his screen. Mr. Mafum is an independent consultant who works for more than 15 years in various FAO projects, assisting us, as well as with other organizations in various uh, countries in the region. He is currently the executive officer for the World Aquaculture Society of the African Chapter. Blessing, kindly share your screen. Thank you. Please, Blessing, you can start. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anna Meneses, and thank you to FAO. Uh, I am introduced. Uh, greetings, everybody from South Africa, from the World Aquaculture Society in Africa. So I will present the regional review of aquaculture in sub-Saharan Africa, the key messages from that review, the status and trends. Okay, many thanks to the World Fisheries Trust, um, as well as uh, to the FAO officers in head office in Rome, as well as sub-regions of Africa for all um, inputs to this review. Right, this is the geographic coverage of Sub-Saharan Africa, that's 49 countries and territories south of the Sahara. I must emphasize that there's so much disparities between the countries in terms of geoeconomics and that the countries of the region are at various levels and stages with regards to aquaculture development. The main data sources for the review were the FAO fisheries and aquaculture as well as trade statistics until 2018. FAO technical papers and fact sheets were also reviewed we also collected a significant body of information from other sources, including various country reports, published journals, newsletters, and other published material. The previous review was done in 2015. If we compare it to today, sorry about that. Okay, there are so many key messages There are many key messages we can talk about when reviewing aquaculture development in sub-Saharan Africa in the last five years. However, we try to pull 10 key messages that either have affected our developmental trajectory, but also some of the key issues as we move forward. Because of the desirable natural resource potential we have, as well as political will demonstrated at the highest continental level, uh, coupled with increased general public understanding on aquaculture, we foresee the way forward is quite positive. However, as we mostly still in early stages of growth and development, it is important for all actors to continue promoting aquaculture in various ways. 
for states to effectively domesticate the Africa Union Action Plan, including the development of strategic investment plans and provision for adequate funding for the action plans. Especially now at a time when there is so much focus on the blue economy agenda where aquaculture has been identified as a sector to prioritize. Annual production rate has slightly decelerated in recent years. If you look at the graph there, you can see annual growth rate in Sub-Saharan Africa being pretty impressive from around 2006 to 2014. And then we had a general slowdown in growth from then on to 2018. This is largely due to a drop in seaweed production in Indian Ocean producing countries. There was also a general slowdown in production from key producer countries, notably Nigeria and Kenya in the last five years. We however expect a slowdown in, from Ghana from 2019 due to recent disease outbreak. But this was compensated by a surge in tilapia production across the region, as well as continued modest growth in mariculture, excluding seaweeds. What can we do about it? We need to collectively address issues bedeviling the seaweed sector in Indian Ocean. We'll talk about it in the next slides. States need to continue focusing on attracting an enabling environment for new investments. States need to address challenges on collection of aquaculture data from the field and submission to the FAO. There are some general improvements, but still many sub-Saharan African countries need to step up their efforts on this front. Uh, blessing, we cannot hear you. Please go ahead, Blessing. Sorry, um, there's a background, you know, I'm hearing, you know, my presentation being flagged on the background, so that was a little bit confusing. Please go ahead, Blessing. So okay, we can, I will, because we I will cannot continue. Uh, key message number three, special focus on addressing seaweed production challenges. Just to give you a figure, seaweed production peaked in 2016 at nearly 200,000 metric tons. This has significantly dropped to only 112,000 metric tons in 2018. By far, Zanzibar is the biggest producer of seaweeds, accounting for about 90% of all seaweed volume produced in Sub-Saharan Africa. What can we do to change this trajectory on seaweed sector? FAO in partnership with government and research institutions has recently done a situational analysis project focusing on seaweed farming in Zanzibar, which culminated to a report, Understanding Diseases and Controlling Seaweed Farming in Zanzibar. The report came up with several recommendations, including the need for biosecurity management strategies for the seaweed, the focus on alternative livelihoods options, for farmers through projects, need for further innovation and research. Seem to be slowing signs of slowdown. Tilapia or strains production has significantly increased, may have probably overtaken catfish now. I'm sure this will be reflected in 2019 figures, which we don't have yet. Now tilapia production alone recorded an impressive growth of about 200% compared to a decade ago. New tilapia investments are evident in new countries and investments in key producer countries which started over a decade ago have either grown significantly or remained resilient. Shrimp production seemed to be another success story having rebounded in Madagascar and now in Mozambique but also emerged in new countries such as Tanzania, Nigeria, and Ghana. What can we do moving ahead? We need to analyze and address the catfish value chain issues and see what's now impacting its previously impressive growth. Obviously, there will be a range of issues to look at from production to markets. 
the need to strengthen the tilapia value chain, taking advantage of its con continued consumer favorability in almost all parts of sub-Saharan Africa. Thankfully, both for, um, the FAO recently launched a project fish for ACP, which is analyzing the species value chain aspects. Yeah, other species such as sea cucumbers, milkfish, stegion, and possibly upcoming big land based salmon prospects in the kingdom of Lesotho and others. The established domestic and regional international markets need strengthening. Sub Saharan Africa's population is growing fastest than other regions of the world. We expect it to double to 2.1 billion by 2050. There is also rapid urbanization taking place. This is one big opportunity for domestic markets to expand. Intra-regional markets have also expanded, demonstrated largely by the tilapia supply chain. Export markets for most high value species seem to be well established, but the need to address market diversification issues is important. And this includes a focus on domestic intra-regional emerging affluent markets. COVID-19 taught us um, a lesson on market diversification. As a way forward, there is need for improved market infrastructure, especially in urban centers. Government and private sector can work on this. Product value addition is an important prospect as volumes grow and market diversify. We are looking forward to the Africa continental free trade area and what positives it brings in addressing smooth movement of farmed fish products across the continent. Market information systems are needed across the region. Good examples are the price commodity information produced by the Ghana Chamber of Aquaculture, as well as the Nigeria Catfish Forum, which are shared widely to various networks. It will be good if we could work to come up with an Africa price index for our farmed fish products to promote the industry. Aquatic diseases have increased in the last 10 years. No doubt, one of the biggest threats we had in the last decade was the emergence of aquatic diseases. This was a real wake up call that we are at risk as we also discovered our biosecurity management measures were weak. The white spot virus decimated the shrimp industry in Madagascar and Mozambique 10 years ago. This seemed to be under control. The EUS is still with us. Um, recent outbreak having been in Malawi in July 2020. The ISKNV virus uh, is affecting the tilapia industry in Ghana. The tilapia lake virus, you know, we fear that one uh, because we heard that you know, it was reported in Uganda a couple of days ago. And of course the seaweed disease I talked about earlier. And then we have a range of on, all these on-farm pathogens which are also reportedly on the increase. What are the options for the way forward? States to continue developing their aquatic animal health strategies, which need to take into account important elements such as surveillance, risk assessment, disease profiling, but also socioeconomic impacts of aquatic diseases amongst other elements. Antimicrobial resistance awareness, which recently started, needs to continue. In terms of international level guidance, the FAO has recently launched a new initiative, Progressive Management Pathway for Aquatic Biosecurity. This is a tool that is expected to assist national and international improvement of biosecurity in aquaculture production. We are looking forward to the implementation of the PMP program in Africa. Mainstreaming disaster risk reduction, mitigation, and resilience is important in aquaculture strategies. Like anywhere else around the world, climate change impacts are upon us. Drought in parts of East and Southern Africa, increased frequency of cyclones and flooding, sea level rise, amongst other impacts. COVID-19 was no doubt an unprecedented hit to the sector's value chains. What can we do about it? Since this is regarded as an emerging issue, we need further capacity building on resilience, adaptation, mitigation measures. 
This needs to be ingrained in our agriculture development plans. Adopting and implementing provisions of the FAO ecosystem approach to aquaculture could be a starting point. FAO has also developed other guidance tools on climate change in fisheries and aquaculture, which can be adopted and applied. The promotion of climate smart aquaculture concept at farm level should continue. It has started, but we need it to continue. For COVID-19, continued monitoring and surveillance is needed leading to some policy responses. For instance, the consideration of relief packages to affected industry players. Sorry about that. Looking ahead, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa needs to address the overarching factors um, limiting aquaculture growth. I just listed these um, and um, I think in the review, we tried to cover them and what needs to be done. That is ineffective developmental approaches, the weak administrative and institutional framework, the underdeveloped value chains, the low availability and high cost of key resources for production, the lack of disaster mitigation, adaptation and preparedness strategies I talked about earlier, and the few reliable production statistics. Key message nine, traditional specific aquaculture challenges still persist. I think we have heard about this for many years now. Tenure policies, um, seed, aqua feeds, genetics, research, technologies, environmental integrity, and financing. Um, this can be done through adaptive, in innovative practices, possibly through projects government support to be more effective, especially anything that creates an enabling environment and smoothening of the private sector investments. Financing mechanisms that work for the sector, for instance, attracting global private equity funds, as well as government guarantees, loan facilities. An example is the African Development Bank loan arrangement with the government of Zambia. Other special strategic programs are needed to take uh, the sector forward. Um, perhaps some of the special additional projects we can look off as we move ahead include projects on women and youth in aquaculture, the blue economy and the aquaculture trust strategic investment guide needs to be developed. The Ecomark level, our own homegrown eco certification scheme, which has started for the tilapia and catfish, needs to continue. It's, however, important to emphasize that strategic development programs must be specific, tailored to address different levels of needs and development by the different countries within the region. Lastly, FAO strategic intervention and part funding to the sector needs to continue. FAO has been an all-weather strategic partner for aquaculture development for many years now. Interventions by the FAO and its partners are evident and have indeed contributed to the growth trajectory we experience today. We still need more efforts through their various program arrangements, such as the Blue Growth Initiatives, the Technical Cooperation Programs, and the international level guidance that is ongoing, as well as the partnership for resource mobilization with uh, various partners that are engaged to. However, Africa Union states and all actors need to be conscious that further development of the sector cannot rely only from development project funding, but to focus on other homegrown funding mechanisms too such as the Africa Solidarity Trust Fund, which started a few ago as a good example as we move forward. Thank you very much. We, I, I do apologize. We are having a few issues with the net. I want to thank Blessing for highlighting the aquaculture trends, the salient issues and the key message. And uh, I want to, to recognize also that about 300 participants are attending this uh, webinar. I thank you all. I compliment this presentation uh, with a panel of experts. 
I want to introduce Professor Michelle Jafet Ntiba, the Principal Secretary of the State Department for Fishers, Aquaculture and the Blue Economy, the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries and Irrigation, Kenya. Prior to this, he held other positions as the Director of School of Biological Science at the University of Nairobi, and was the first executive secretary for the Lake Victoria Fishers Organization. Sorry, I think we lost, we lost Anna, but um, she has already presented Professor Timba. Uh, we, the another pan panelist is Stella William, who is the Professor of Agriculture Economics in Uoloa University. The third panelist is Dr. Sloan, who is the fisheries and aquaculture specialist. He has worked for many institutions, including the World Bank, the World Fish, NEPAD, and the other African institution. The fourth is Dr. Lewis Bangwe. He's a senior agriculture officer of African Development Bank, and is a big supporter of commercial aquaculture in Africa. Ricardo, please, if you can play the statement of our great expert panel. FAO representatives, panelists, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk a little about the new paradigm shift in brew economy in Africa. Brew growth is a key area that emerged with a huge potential to contribute to Africa's sustainable economic transformation as offered by productive oceans, seas, lakes, and river ecosystems. If we harness these ecosystems in deliberate, it will certainly rekindle socioeconomic renaissance of the African continent. Available statistics indicate that the African blue economy sectors are currently generating 206 billion US dollars and 49 billion million jobs, which is projected to grow to 576 billion US dollars by value and 78 million jobs by 2063. The vision for the development of blue economy in Africa is captured very well in various African Union instruments, including AU Agenda 2063, the African Blue Economy Strategy, the Policy Framework for Fisheries and Aquaculture in Africa, the 2050 Africa Integrated Maritime Charter, and the Lome Charter. In these instruments, there is a clear definition of the various components of the African blue economy that have the promise of enormous potential for transforming both the economy and the social life for Africa. These components include, amongst others, fisheries, aquaculture, shipping, maritime, tourism, energy, and so on and so forth. Africa can benefit from fisheries and aquaculture being a major component of the blue economy. Today we are experiencing stagnation of fish production from capture fisheries due to overexploitation and natural causes. This requires an alternative fish production mechanism to fill this gap. Aquaculture is the only viable alternative fish production technology to fill this gap. Indeed, there has been recent steady increases in both public and private sector investments in the commercial aquaculture continent-wide. This is the reason why, in the last 10 years, aquaculture production has doubled from 1 million metric tons in 2008 to well over 2,000 metric tons by 2017. The farm gate value of fish has also increased from 2 million US dollars to 3.2 million during the same period. Certainly, therefore, aquaculture is poised to continue to grow in the next several decades across the African continent. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by saying this, that sustained aquaculture production will provide the surest promise for reliable quality protein for a growing African population. This requires a sustained support in investments, financing, technology, and training. 
I am therefore encouraging Africa to pay a specific attention in growing this part of the blue economy, not only for food and nutrition security, but also for socioeconomic benefits for the individuals at the family level and the national gross and domestic product for our countries. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me thank the FAO team, especially Dr. Anna, for inviting me to be a part of the panel. In terms of my reflection, Nigeria started way back in the 1940s, researching into fish farming, first at Onikon, Lagos, then in Ibadan, in the 50s at Panyam Fish Station in uh, Northwest Nigeria, and in the 60s, many retired male civil servants got into fish farming for employment and their uh, adventures. In terms of the question, do you think that this sector will offer employment? Of course, it will offer employment. This has been shown that in the 21st century, both men and women, youths have already joined in fish farming as uh, an entrepreneur. Which are the difficulties young entrepreneurs and women have to face in to enter the food in this food production? Lack of collateral to get bank loans, limited access to government training, limitations to join local, regular, as well as global associations, limitations to innovations and skill training, limitations to opportunities to take farm visits to successful farmers. How can we make fisheries and aquaculture attractive for youth to take up as a profession? We should give them career counseling in the schools as well as in the institutions, encourage internship with successful farmers as an incentive, encourage them joining associations for opportunities to access mentoring as well as be able to go on exchange trips for economic growth. How to improve the link between farmers and agricultural scientists? Network, network, network. We need to encourage fish farmers to visit with scientists at their various institutions to learn about their outcomes. Need to encourage networking for cooperatives, associations through radio talks and TV talks, visit YouTube and social media. What are the major research streams needed for development of the sector in Africa? We need to explore new avenues of domesticating fisheries. The fisheries biologists must work to find out what new species can be domesticated, like latest species, nugilids, carps, bivalves, and various other aquatic organisms so that we can expand the scope of the fishes that we farm in Africa. I thank you very much for this opportunity. Africa faces a major challenge on food and nutritional security. Um, in countries where fish is very important, uh, this comes into two major challenges. First is that uh, the capacity for the wild sources of fish, the, the lakes and the oceans, uh, have reached their limit and therefore cannot produce more. Secondly, because of uh, the rising population, we find that uh, the land uh, which is used for agriculture is also reaching a limit as uh, the land is used for both uh, to be a habitat as well as producing food. Therefore, um, the fish uh, or aquaculture or water provides a very important uh, answer. And in this particular, aquaculture is very important. However, for aquaculture to succeed, uh, there is need to focus on two elements. First is the financial viability uh, of our aquaculture. And secondly, uh, the economic importance of the sector to national economic and development. And therefore, uh, it is important that uh, policies in Africa should really pay attention on uh, the financial viability by investing in technology development and dissemination 
to ensure that the operational efficiency of aquaculture are going to be very good and in return determine um, the viability, the financial viability of aquaculture and make it more competitive. And especially this time when we see a lot of uh, cheaper imports of fish. And secondly, it is important that officials in the ministries responsible for aquaculture are able to determine uh, the uh, social and economic importance of aquaculture by ensuring that uh, the national foods and, and uh, food security and nutrition policies uh, do take into account uh, the, the role of aquaculture. Uh, therefore, again, countries uh, need to ensure that uh, they invest sufficiently um, in this regard. However, we see that despite uh, the potential that aquaculture has uh, to support food and nutrition security as well as livelihood, many countries in Africa are still not allocating enough budgets. Of course, we know that uh, in instances where um, aquaculture is still desirable uh, from a policy point of view, um, but uh, the private sector are not convinced. This is where we need government really to come in and invest and make sure that uh, the bottlenecks, especially the market failures, are addressed uh, by creating environment uh, where um, investment finance will be available, particularly to the small and medium enterprises, especially women. But also it is important that the ministries are able to utilize the FAO guidelines with regard to aquaculture, to use them to develop national aquaculture strategic plans, as well as design uh, research activities that are going to develop uh, the requisite uh, technologies, as well as uh, um, come up with solutions that are going to improve the efficiency uh, of operations and make aquaculture more financially viable, and therefore justify for the reason why ministries of finance should actually invest more in agriculture development. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Timba, Professor Stella, and Dr. Slowan. This is a great presentation. I'm so excited to learn much from you. We will now start with the question and answer session. Those three experts are mostly answering a dozen of questions received by Priori and during this webinar. Unfortunately, the time is not in our favor and they will do their best to address some of them with two or three minutes. I would start, I would like to start with Dr. Bangwe. Dr. Bangwe. What is the role of African Development Bank in mobilizing investment financial for players in the aquaculture value chain? Dr. Bangwe, please. The floor is yours. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen in attendance. Thank you, moderator, for this very useful question. My answer will focus on ADB work in Zambia as an example. The aquaculture sector is growing rapidly, 14% annually in Zambia, and investments are increasing in response to strong national and regional demand for fish. The three key challenges to aquaculture growth in Zambia are fingerlings, feed, and finance, the famous three Fs. My answer to your question will focus on finance. Uh, there is a weak flow of financing in the aquaculture value chain. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the African Development Bank has set as a set of instruments to help unlock the financing challenge. As you might know, the bank has three financing windows. The ADB, which is uh, $93 billion capitalized. The ADF, which is $41 billion capitalized. And the Nigeria Trust Fund, which is $242 million uh, uh, capitalized. The bank's menu financing instruments are quite diverse. Uh, we, uh, the main lending instruments provide long-term debt to public through sovereign uh, loans and also to private sector uh, non-sovereign loans. For example, in, in Zambia, in a board move, the government borrowed $45.5 million in 2017 to invest in the aquaculture uh, development uh, project which of which 20 million is for public investments 
and for creating an enabling environment uh, in the subsector. Another 25 million is in the aquaculture Re revolving fund for direct concessional loans to SMEs. More than 3,000 entrepreneurs will benefit from this, and they have already started benefiting. Uh, Both half of this money has been dispersed uh, through the Citizens Economic Empowerment Commission. These are concessional loans. They are they are not. Uh, um, uh, compared to the uh, private financial institutions. Uh, the project is also training over 1,000 women and youth uh, who are incub incubatees. Uh, and after practical training, they are being tra linked to the uh, same aqua fund for financing. The ADB has worked with FAO to train financial institutions to appraise and process more aquaculture loan fund applications for, for the SMEs. So this way we are using the aqua fund as a platform for mobilizing and leveraging more SME financing. The bank also has various instruments, including guarantees, equity participation, risk management products, trade finance, and also technical assistance funds for, for feasibility studies, training, and capacity building activities. Now, the four main investment criteria for accessing bank financing are uh, uh, strategic alignment to the national and bank policies, commercial viability, development outcomes of the, the project being uh, considered for financing, and also additionality. Uh, generally, for private sector, uh, uh, projects to be financed, a minimum of $20 million project financing will be required with a minimum of 30% sponsors equity. And also a minimum of $10 million would be required for corporate loan uh, financing for expansion of existing uh, corporate entities. Additionally, the projects that include aquaculture should be transformative and combine primary production with processing, scalable and the regional should have regional benefits for small orders through uh, outgrower schemes. Um, the project should be sponsored by local entrepreneurs and where local communities have uh, an equity stake. Uh, preference is given to public private sector projects with an agricultural infrastructure component. And then the bank also has an, a set of application procedures that are available from any, on, on the website and can be provided upon request. Moderator, I thank you. This is the role of the bank in uh, unlocking finance in aquaculture value chains. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bangwe. Uh, the next question goes to Dr. Stella. Dr. Stella, bidding on our friends from African Development Bank. Uh, would you please give your perspective and advice on how could women and youth interested in aquaculture access to government and financial support? Can access thank to you. government. Okay. Thank you very much, Pierre, and thank you everyone on this uh, webinar. In terms of what the African Development Bank can do, one of the things that the women and youth need is really financial support in form of grants, as my brother from uh, Zambia has said, but it is not happening yet at the country level. Nigeria did not have the kind of access to the kind of fund that Zambia has. Nigeria has invested in the African Development Bank and therefore our fish farmers, especially our women and youth, should be able to have access to such grant that Zambia has for training and for incubation. However, this year, African Development Bank has given a call for competition to entrepreneurs. And I'm already encouraging as many of our women and youth to send in their competition. And just yesterday, we got a form uh, from the uh, United States uh, Ambassador's Grant for 120 women who will win an opportunity for training in terms of entrepreneurship. Our group in Kenya, the African 
uh, women in agricultural research and development have been training women entrepreneurs. Thank God this is Beijing plus 25, which we are celebrating in Nigeria, where I, we are having mentees who are young women who are in entrepreneurship to be trained. And so these are some of the things that we need. We need this opportunity for collaboration. We need this opportunity for partnership. We need this opportunity for training, mentoring, as well as incubation. And so I'm praying that the African Development Bank through this webinar would see the need for more access for our women and youth, especially in terms of gender productivity in the 21st century going into the 22nd century. We need this support, we need this help, and we're crying out. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Stella. We are running out of time. Please be brief in your answer. The next question goes to Professor Timba. Professor Timba, clearly from your presentation, blue economy is part of Renaissance for Africa. So how do you see aquaculture fitting in this equation in this new frontier? Professor Timba, please, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for me, is to say that uh, in the blue economy agenda, Africa should really focus on aquaculture since we are endowed with a lot of water around the continent itself, in our lakes and rivers, a lot of rain and things like that. Because the natural fish production uh, probably will come to a standstill. Any new fish will come from farmed systems. And therefore, for me, I think we need to look for monies, particularly from the African Development Bank from even the world because new fish, new fish on our table, new fish for the market will come from farm the system. That's the way I think about it. We can farm in our lakes, we can farm on land, we can farm in the in, 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 the, in the ocean. I think all these opportunities are here for us. We can have aquaponics in all our schools so that our kids in school can learn aquaculture. So that as they get out, they will start farming themselves and start becoming part of the business, food and nutrition security and employment. I think this is my view, and I'm sorry to give the data. In Kenya, we are already having a big program to commercialize aquaculture in, uh, in, uh, in 15 counties. That's a huge area of Kenya on, uh, on the land. We are also farming in our lake. Victoria, in the dams, in the, in the ocean. I think we need to do this as a country. I'm telling just to go this route. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Timba. Our last question goes to Dr. Sloan. Dr. Sloan, taking, talking about the continental cooperation, the author mentioned that the upcoming African continental free trade zone. What will be the impact of aquaculture production considering the possibility of accessing inputs, notably equipment, feed, and other production inputs at more competitive price based on the reduction of import tariff between the parties of the free trade area? Dr. Sloan, you have the floor, please. Yeah, thank you so much. I think the first thing that we need to understand is that um, tariffs are a tax on consumers. And therefore, at the time when Africa needs a lot of fish, uh, it is important for governments to make a, a strategic decision. For instance, we estimate that the, the SADC region, the Southern African region, requires close to 500,000 metric tons of fish every year. And therefore, uh, it is important that uh, countries should take advantage of the African continental free trade area by reducing tax uh, on or tariffs on um, on imports uh, of, of inputs, so that uh, the local capacity to produce is going to be enhanced, and then in return um, the countries can promote fish consumption 
uh, but also, you know, if consumption goes up, then there's going to be a lot of opportunities for the local producers. But the tariffs are going to be really a deterrent on this. We do accept that, uh, you know, tariffs uh, are very fairly low in customs, mostly customs duty, but we also find a lot of non-tariff barriers to trade, uh, such as the procedures at the borders and the, you know, the standards and so on and so forth. So these also need to be addressed. But uh, good enough, uh, we know that the, uh, the, the African Union strategy on, uh, on trade has identified uh, six main uh, priorities, which we need to take up uh, advantage of uh, for aquaculture first is that the uh, African Union is supporting countries to improve on their trade policies, uh, including integration of aquaculture uh, into uh, national agriculture investment plans. Secondly, uh, there is an opportunity for trade facilitation. Uh, thirdly, um, they're also supporting the productive capacity so we can improve production and productivity of uh, aqua farms. Uh, the fourth area is the trade-related infrastructure. Uh, this includes uh, markets, but also cross-border facilities through which uh, imported imports uh, can come in through very quickly. Uh, the this, this fifth one is the trade information. And the last one is the factor market integration where we allow trade experts to move across the countries and support each other. Therefore, in the, in, in the end, uh, if countries take advantage of this Africa continental free trade area, uh, it's going to be really very good and uh, productive for aquaculture. But still, we need to ensure that we can further support the capacities of our countries to take advantage of this. And I think this is where uh, FAO uh, would be very uh, instrumental in supporting their member states in Africa uh, to move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sloan. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, we, we will not, we have received a large number of questions from the audience due to the limit time. We won't be able to address more questions in this webinar. However, the secretary will note down all the question and pass the question to the authors to consider in finalizing the, the review. Uh, at this time, I would, I would pass the floor to Matthias for a very brief conclusion remarks. Matthias, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Pierre. Um, very sorry to be losing Anna in the, in the course of this uh, of this webinar, but thanks to Pierre for taking over. Thanks to Blessing, our lead author. Thank you very much to our distinguished panelists. It's my great pleasure to give some concluding remarks based on this exciting past hour of exchange on aquaculture development, development in Africa. First, uh, let me start by saying it's encouraging to see that aquaculture output in the region has been growing steadily. And I think we should complement the proactive efforts made by many countries in the region to expand aquaculture in a sustainable manner and indeed largely following the principles and the guidance of the, of the code. And um, let me also sideline a little bit here and also answer one question that we had in the question and answer sec uh, uh, box that was addressed to the secretariat. And what are we doing to help member states to understand and implement the code uh, in policy development in aquaculture sector? And um, the most important point in this regard I would like to point out is that um, we have since 2001, a global forum for exchange in aquaculture, and that is the COFI Subcommittee on Aquaculture. And in that forum, we have a standing item called the progress uh, reporting on the implementation of provisions of the code with regard to aquaculture and culture-based fisheries. So in that session, we, we summarize the main analytical results of the, of the self-assessment by members, uh, the self-assessment on the implementation of the code in aquaculture. And uh, that report that we give there also includes uh, an assessment of the regional fisheries bodies and aquaculture networks. So a very important forum for exchange. 
uh, on the provisions of the code. But uh, to carry on with the uh, concluding remarks here, within the African blue economy, aquaculture has a huge potential to really drive transformation and increase production of locally produced protein, but also micronutrients, which are so important for food security and for nutrition and for creating livelihood opportunities. And we have heard that continued growth will require continued efforts so it's a number of issues and those include the credit and financing and especially those flexible financing mechanisms which allow the engagement of youth and of women, the access to technology, to innovations along the value chain from input supply all the way to uh, processing, food safety and uh, marketing. Importantly, the capacity building and the training, but also uh, and also very importantly, the uh, national, regional and intra-regional collaboration and networking. So we heard that the sector is negatively impacted by a number of factors, mostly climate change and related natural disasters, disease very important and now COVID-19 and therefore really the sector needs to reduce risks, mitigate risks, and overall enhance its resilience. And although a large amount of the aquaculture production is consumed locally, at the same time, we heard that trade really should be facilitated more through a harmonization of standards to, to expand markets. Also, and this is my second last point, um, better information on the ground. And this may possibly be facilitated through uh, engagement uh, with FAO's uh, new hand-in-hand -hand initiative will really help decision-making and will eventually facilitate growth. So on a final thought, the we are really encouraged by the let's say adaptive and innovative approaches already in place that have supported the growth in aquaculture. We see that much more can be done, much more needs to be done, but I can really feel the momentum and I'm excited about the future of aquaculture in, sub in Sub-Saharan Africa. So with that, thank you very much uh, to all of you and back to you, Pierre. Thank you so much. Uh, we are arriving at the end of our webinar. Thank you for all panelists and for the, thank you for the author. I look forward to see you in our next webinar, which is tomorrow. Thank you so much and goodbye to everyone.